It is the first Sunday of Advent, yes. And so what we do together as a group, as a community, is we remember what the purpose of Christmas is and the meaning of Christmas is, and we do that in the coming weeks so that it's just not Christmas morning. You know, some people say, when do you have your Christmas? And uh, you know what that is. That's basically when do people get gifts. But you know, that's not when Christmas really is. Christmas is this whole season, and it's we remember what happened when Jesus was born. And so we're going to look at, this time, the characters of Christmas. And we're going to look at some of the uh, major characters in the Christmas story and talk about what was actually going on there and reflect on how that affects us today. So today we're going to start with Zechariah. Okay, Zechariah is a terrific story, and it begins in the Gospel of Luke. And it starts with the introduction, and we're going to go through it verse by verse, and then talk about angels a little bit at the end. So, in verse 1, beginning in verse 1, it starts off, and it sounds almost like a, uh, a historical his- novel, okay? The historian Luke writes it this way. He says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. This is the story of Jesus. And just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. And he's talking to this guy, Theophilus, who may be a person or it may just be a literary kind of thing because Theo means God and Philus means lover, God lover. So it could be us your God lover. So he's written this for us so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. And so the whole gospel begins with this statement that, um, you know, my brother who's a chemist would love that beginning. Tell me what's going on, okay? And it's really clear. And then, then it becomes the setting of the appearance. And in the original language, the flow of the language changes greatly right here. It's almost like you, if you're reading uh, today, the way people talk, going to King James English, okay? And so there is a change in the tone in verse five from the first four verses. And this is where we start learning about Zechariah. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, Herod's a terrible king, many ways. He, he was uh, paranoid and killed many people in his family. Uh, <laughs> He was the king of Judea. Now, Judea means land of the Jews. So every place the Jews lived in that area was known as Judea. There was a priest named Zechariah. Now, the name Zechariah means the Lord has remembered. That's what his name means. Now, if you go back to the end of the Old Testament, 400 years earlier in Malachi, There was 400 years where there was no prophets. There was no word from the Lord. There was no, I mean, if you go back 400 years in our country, today's um, 2023, if you went back to like, uh, you know, I guess 19, 18, 17, 1783 or 1683, there'd be a lot difference today. So for 400 years, there was silence. And so out of that silence, Zechariah is the first one mentioned in Luke's account, and his name means the Lord remembered. And it says, um, so he, he, the, it, it continues in this. It says, in time of Herod, king of Herod, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and his wife also was named Elizabeth, who was descendant of Aaron. And so Aaron, in the Old Testament, had 24 sons. And from his descendants, there was the people who took care of the temple in Jerusalem. And this was a very busy place. They would have two sacrifices every day for the forgiveness of sins, sacrificing animals. And it was a big affair. They had other sacrifices, the other special feasts, special holidays. There were 14,000 priests in the time of the first century serving in Jerusalem. 
and they would rotate. They'd do other things and rotate working in the temple. It was a very busy place. Both of them, and so not only was uh, Zechariah, but Elizabeth was descended from priests. Both of them were righteous. Not only they had descendants from priests, they were righteous. They were good people in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees and blamelessly. And so not only did they observe them, but that last word there says they observed them blamelessly. So very high marks for them. And they were childless which is unusual, you see, because here's somebody that in their culture, they thought children were their sign of your good, you know, your blessings. But they were childless. They were righteous, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now, I don't know how much very old is for you. Most people, anybody 10 years older than you is very old. (laughs) Uh, But they were pretty old for having kids. Okay, that's the beginning. So once when Zechariah's division was on duty, they had 24 divisions, he was serving as a priest before God. Now he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple with the Lord and burn incense. Now this was a very great thing because it was like winning the lottery. One out of 14,000 chance. Many priests went their whole lives and never went into this. This is the... There was the Holy of Holies, which nobody could go into the high priest once a year. But then outside of the Holy of Holies, in an adjacent room that was only separated by a veil, a big tapestry, they lit incense. They did these other things, and they burned the incense. And these priests would rotate on who had the honor on burning incense after the sacrifice for sins for people. And uh, in verse, and it keeps going to when the time came for the burning of incest came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. So the way this works, if you came to Jerusalem for forgiveness of sins, you'd bring an animal, depending on how much money you had, a dove or a goat or something else, a sheep. And this is a sign that Jesus was poor because when his parents came and sacrificed, they had two turtle doves, the cheapest, the, the, uh, Thing. So he didn't come from money. And so all the people would go outside and they would worship that had donated or donated. That is, they given the animals for the sacrifice. And it was kind of like, I'm not a Catholic, but I think in the Catholic, they had this thing where when they go to choose a new bi- pope, all the bishops come together and they, um, they do this outside the Vatican. And then they have this big, you know, prayerful uh, vote on who's the next pope. And if they, they make it through and they vote for the next pope, or if they don't do it, excuse me, they burn these ballots and the ballots have black smoke that comes out and everybody says, well, we don't have a pope. And then if they get to the point where they all agree and they vote for this pope and they feel the Lord's leading them to do that, they put a chemical on the fire. And when the uh, smoke comes out of the top of the uh, building, and then they know that, okay, this is white smoke, and so this is, this is the time. And so people would come outside this building in this case when they were sacrificing the, uh, the animals, and when they saw the burning of the incense at the end of it, then the, uh, the priest would come out and he would say a word to them, and it would be the highlight of the event. So this is the context of what was going on. Now, here's what happens. It's very unusual. An angel from the Lord appears to Zechariah. This hadn't happened for over 400 years. Okay, that an angel. And we get this idea of an angel as, you know, a baby in a diaper playing a harp. Angels are almost always associated with fear. And so angels were very powerful beings that had some kind of numinous quality that made people afraid. Okay, and so it says in verse 11, the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense where he was supposed to replace this incense and light it. And so Zechariah responded, he's afraid. And this pattern is similar to how uh, prophets in the Old Testament uh, had appearances of God to them and appearances of angels. Zechariah is afraid. It says, when Zechariah saw this angel, he was startled and gripped with, have you ever been gripped with fear? 
just the hair stood up on the back of your neck and you just felt fear. And he was gripped with this. And Zechariah is given a message from God, from the angel. And the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Um, your prayer has been heard. So what prayer was it? Well, it may be earlier in his life, of course, he probably prayed that he and his wife could have a child. But I wonder at this point in his life if he really wasn't praying that every day because he thought this is really not possible. Maybe he was praying for the Messiah to come. In any case, both of those things are getting ready to happen. It says, he will be a joy and delight, this child that you're going to have to you. And many rejoice because of his birth. As a dad, if he'd have stopped right there, Zachariah would have been thrilled. To know that your child is going to be a joy and delight to you, and everybody will rejoice in his life. That would have been enough. But it goes on. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he's never to take wine or fermented drink. You see, um, he's supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he had this unique power. He didn't need to be filled by being intoxicated with something that he could not be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Even before he was born, this child was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he would bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. Bring back people to God. Let me tell you, God is still doing that. I don't know where you are in your life, but this Christmas God may be bringing you back to God. Because sometimes people stray, people get lost along the way. He says, this God, John, is going to bring back many of people. And then he said, he will go on before the people Uh, before the Lord, in the spirit and the power of who? Elijah. And this was a prophecy in the Old Testament. And it says, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. In some translations, it says, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. You know what's interesting about this as I'm reading it as a dad? According to the way it's written, It's not because the parents are upset because the children have done something to disconnect. It's because the parents have disconnected. We live in a culture today where a lot of parents have disconnected for their children. A lot of fathers have disconnected to their children. And he says that John, this new child, will reconnect fathers to their children. Don't we need that today? We need a culture today where fathers will reconnect with their children, where mothers will reconnect to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make a people prepared for the Lord. Because you got to get yourself prepared. Sometimes people come to church, you say, I didn't get much out of it today. And, and you know, I wonder if you ever ask yourself, well, what did you go in with? What kind of attitude did you go with, with you know? You go in with saying, you know, not the right attitude, and you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. He says, I'm going to make a people ready. And this is what John was going to do, make people ready for Jesus. And he says, uh, by the way, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah. And some people thought John was Elijah, and he was like Elijah, to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And he would turn what? The hearts of the parents, the fathers and the mothers to their children, the hearts of the children to their parents, both ways. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. That's a haunting verse right there. If that doesn't happen, what happens when the family breaks down completely? What happens when fathers are disconnected from children and mothers disconnect from children and children disconnect from their parents? It's not good. And so this is the message that Zechariah gets. And Zechariah hears the message, and unfortunately, he doubts. He doubts the message. Zechariah asks the angel, how can I be sure of this? I mean, I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. How could we possibly have children? Now, what you don't get here, and what 
a long time I didn't really understand is, uh, remember Mary said the same thing when she saw the angel. And the angel said, you're going to have a baby and you're a virgin. She said, well, how is this possible? But isn't that what Zachariah says? And so why is Zachariah punished and Mary's not? Well, it's because we don't read it in Greek, okay? Okay, what, what happens here is he actually says, uh, Zechariah responds to them um, by expressing, uh, Zechariah's question begins with, on what basis? The word is not really how. The word is, he's, he's kind of questioning the angel, and he says, on what basis is this going to happen? Now, when Mary says, how would this be? What she is asking, how is it going to happen? She's not questioning that it's going to happen. She's just wondering, how is it going to happen? She sees a virgin. In Luke 134, Mary says, how would this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. She just wondered, well, how is it going to work? Zachariah says, on what basis? So Zechariah doesn't have faith. He is questioning the angel, and the angel's uh, response to Zechariah is pretty strong. The angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news, and you're questioning it. Now you'll be silent. And you'll not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. And so he, here he is. He gets a sign, and the sign is kind of a punitive sign. It's a sign that, uh, you know, it's going to cause you some anxiety because as a priest, what he's supposed to do after he lights the incense is walk out in front of the great group of people there and speak a word to them. Okay, read some scriptures. He can't do that. He's lost his voice. In fact, if you read this carefully, not only can he not speak, I don't think he can hear. Because in chapter 1, verse 62, it says this, then they made signs to Zechariah, his father, to find out what he would name the child. So he couldn't speak and he couldn't hear. And they had to talk to him through sign language. Now, if you were to be struck that way this morning, would it get you attention? All of a sudden, you couldn't hear anything. All of a sudden, you couldn't speak. For some of us, it would be harder than others. <laughs> you could not speak. Could not hear. This is what happened to Zechariah. Zach this was his sign. Got his attention. And then the miracle takes place. The miracle just doesn't happen when Jesus, John was born. It happens when she gets pregnant, okay? It says, uh, meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the temple, and they wondered why he stayed in there so long. He was in longer than he was supposed to. He finally came out. He's supposed to speak to us. He doesn't speak, and they realized hey, something's happened. He's seen something in there. For he kept making signs to them, but was unable to speak. Now, the Bible is, uh, in many ways, a book that uh, you know, doesn't tell you specifics of everything, but we, I think, pretty much, this, this, what happened with Zachariah and his wife is they conceived a child in the regular way. And if you don't know what that is, tell, talk to your parents later. Um, a lot later for some of you. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. So Zachariah and his wife, and after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. So the first person that sees her pregnant is Mary. And the Lord has done this for me, she says. And in these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And so it's a joy for her. She's finally pregnant. Okay, she might be uh, 65 years old and pregnant. Are we, all, are we all ready for that? Would you be ready for that? The child is born. This is a miracle, okay? 
And when it's time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord has shown her great mercy, and they shared her great joy. It's a joyful thing. And Zechariah, he gets his voice back. It says, on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah, because that's the way you did things. But his mother spoke up, and she said, no, call him John. And they said to her, oh, come on, there's nobody in your family who's by the name John. Don't call him John, call him Zachariah. Then they made signs to his father because he couldn't hear to find out what he was to be named. And he asked for a writing tablet, okay? And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, this is no debate. His name is John. (laughs) <laughs> and immediately after he wrote that, his mouth was open, his tongue set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country of Judea, and people were talking about all these things, and everybody who heard about wondered about it and was asking, what then is this child that's going to be? For the Lord's hand is shortly, certainly with him. And so this joyful event happened to the senior adult couple and it got everybody to thinking of what's going on here. And as I've been looking at this story, I got this, got this thought about angels. You know, we, we rarely talk about angels today. And I want to say just a few words about angels. Luke is telling us at the beginning of this book the facts in which he has researched the historical account of what actually happened. And in this account, it begins with an angelic visit. Now, in modern day, today, people often look at this, well, mostly, as mythological, as supernatural, and a lot of skeptics would repudiate this. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's just our culture today doesn't believe in this. And I don't know how much you believe in angels. Do you believe in guardian angels? Do you believe in angels? There's a story, just because I wanted to get a, a story about something that looks pretty dramatic. Well, there's a story. This happened uh, several years ago. It happened on August 13th in 1963 in Shepton, Pennsylvania. Okay, and there was a a cave-in at a coal mine. Here's a picture of the coal mine. Okay, and uh, it was three people that were stuck down way underground. It was a hard stone rock. They couldn't get to them. One of them died immediately, and two were left down there. And what was unusual about this was the rescue. Um, They used a, a drill to drill down into the little cavern where they were. They were in a, a, a box six foot wide by six foot long, about five foot high. And that's what was left. And somehow they were able to find this cavern by listening to tapping and drill a pipe. This is the first time they ever done this. And so it got in the news and it got, everybody was following in the news because these two guys were still alive. And they drilled this pipe down to their cavern and they were trapped and they were able to, after three days, put some oxygen down there. Okay, and then they passed some water down there and they were able to get a little bit of food down there and the rescue operation uh, was going well, they thought, and they could hear them tapping and then all of a sudden the tapping went away. And it became a week, and uh, finally it was two weeks, and they, it came from a rescue operation to a recovery operation. Okay, and so, uh, uh, but just when they thought, you know, it wouldn't work, they, they were able to get in this, this special drill that was uh, given by uh, Rockefeller, okay? He gave them this, this expensive drill that drilled down and helped them, and it was a... Uh, I don't know, a whole about this big around. Could you get through that? And uh, they, they found that they were alive, okay? And when they got to them, they wanted to get them out. And so uh, they actually put oil down the hole and they covered themselves with lubrication and they were able to pull them up, these two miners, up, okay? And uh, it was just a miracle. Here's a picture of the two, two miners, 
okay? One of them was like a father to the other one, okay? Older guy, younger guy. They were there a long time, um, and they survived it, and it was a miracle. But the interesting thing part about it was a newspaper uh, had an article about it, okay? It was the Pittsburgh Post, and the title of the article, it said, Miracles say, Miners Saved by Miracle. And everybody loved it. Uh, but there was part of the, he- the subheading in the, in the newspaper report. It says, Miners Suffered Hallucination While Trapped Underground. And you see, what was that about? Well, they saw angels. They saw an angel. For two weeks, they were under trapped. And both of them talk about this angelic being that came among them and was there for them. And they would not recount it. They were asked by many people. They were investigated by it. And so for a lot of people, this became a hallucination. My question is, do you think it was a hallucination? Do you think it's possible that God could take an angel to send to somebody. You know, in the New Testament and a lot of places in the Bible, the primary function of an angel is not just to communicate. It is to protect people of God in times of crisis. Many places in the Bible it says that. And Luke the historian begins his account of Jesus' life by introducing us to the reality and supernatural experience of this being an angel that came. And, uh, you know, in the Bible, there's these stories of how people, when they realized that there was existence of angels, it changed the way they lived. In uh, Old Testament, there was Elisha, and he was in Dothan, and he was um, in a cottage in a small house with his servant, and the house became surrounded by an army on all sides. And the servant woke up, and he knew this army was out to kill Elisha. And he looks out the window, and he says, Elisha, we're in big trouble. And Elisha gets up, and he looks out, and he walks out and looks around the house, and he says, no, nah, we're going to be all right. And his servant says, what are you talking about? There's armies all around us. And Elisha responded. He says, don't fear, because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah's servant thought, man, you are out of your mind. Look at me, there's only two of us and there's an army around us. And Elisha prayed and he prayed, Lord, open my servant's eyes. Let him see what I see. And God opened his servant's eyes and behold, he saw the heavenly host, the army of angels that surrounded the army around them. And it changed You know, Elisha saw through the veil and he saw that the reality that the servant could not see. We live in a world that we are like these two, these reporters who wrote this article. Hallucinations didn't really happen. It's called faith. God wants us to be a people of faith. And angels did a remarkable thing here with John. Uh, John's dad, Zacharias. And uh, today, I don't know where you are in your life or what you believe about spirituality, but let me tell you the truth is there is are, are angels. And there are angels out there when you least probably are aware of it that help you and make you stay out of trouble than you could have gotten in. And when you're a person who's following Christ, there is, there is something out there. Uh, we watched this, this movie, Mission Impossible, new Mission Impossible movie. It's fun. Okay, and in the movie, he is fighting, okay, Hunt is fighting against AI, artificial intelligence. Something that has happened, we read about this all the time, the danger of AI. And uh, I was talking about this with uh, Robert Gold yesterday. We had a men's breakfast, and we had a great conversation. I wish you could have been there. It was really smart. And uh, in our <laughs> In our conversation, you see, in the movie, the, uh, the lead of the, uh, this artificial te- intelligence was named Gabriel. And he said, oh, what if we have an angelic intelligence around us? What if surrounding us all the time is an AI? 
is an angelic intelligence that is there to help us, that is there to be with us, that works through the Holy Spirit and through God's power to do things. I pray that uh, God will reveal that to us, to give us more faith.